from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell, not at a cricket ground this week, but I am in the commentary box for the BBC World Service on Centre Court, Wimbledon. Now, I know it doesn't look very flash in my background if you're watching us on YouTube, but I can tell you what I can see out the window in front of me is a beautifully manicured lawn. Those stripes, well, they're just being manicured a little bit more at the moment because the mower is being trundled up and down. The white lines are being refreshed with a little bit of paint. And yes, I'm commentating on the tennis uh, this fortnight, but still, of course, here to bring you stumped. I reckon there might have been a couple of cricketers in the stands, a little bit incognito the other day, having a bit of a breather between uh, test matches but there were no social media posts if they were here i think they very much wanted to keep it under wraps jim maxwell for the abc in sydney and nice to see you installed at uh, a sporting heaven at uh, wimbledon everyone wants to go to wimbledon and well as we know it's almost impossible to get tickets but they still queue <laughs> don't they they're still making them queue i don't understand that um but um here in australia i suppose most of the interest is in a series that's going on on the subcontinent, and uh, Australia's having some fun with the turning ball. And there was a bit of a barbecue the other night with Smith and um, Kawaja, which probably highlighted more the uh, emotional immaturity still of uh, Steve Smith in the way he reacted to uh, being run out. Anyway, it's a bit of fun, a couple of tests, and something we can uh, enjoy from afar as we do with Wimbledon. And, of course, India and England, a test match. Again? I thought that was supposed to be last year, Shari. Well, it probably will rank as one of the longest ever test series in the game of cricket about a year apart. But yeah, hello, this is Charu Sharma. I'm in New Delhi, actually the national capital region in Gurgaon at this lovely Western Hotel where I'm about to, uh, we're getting set to host uh, one of these wonderful felicitation ceremonies for achievers and leaders under 40. Well, I look forward to meeting those guys. But of course, so much cricket going on and the colour is green. With envy, Alison. I'd love to be at Wimbledon myself. Um, but yeah, it, there's a lot of attention on this final test, Jim, Alison, about um, the composition of the team, about the lack of leadership because of uh, all the illness and injury and everything else. So yeah, a lot of cricket to look forward to. But I must confess, all of next week in a bit, I'm actually away. So I'm going to miss most of the action because I'm going on a trek to Kashmir in the middle of all of this. Wonderful. Are we going to cross you from Kashmir? That would be something, wouldn't it? And by the way, are you, are you not one of those achievers and leavers under 40, Charu? Surely. Surely. <laughs> well, under 30. So I spent some time to reach that. It is good to see you both. First of all, well, it's the end of an era for the England men's white ball team. Owen Morgan has retired from international cricket and stepped down as England's white ball captain after seven years in charge. In that time, England have won the 2019 World Cup, reached the top of the one day and 2020 rankings. And on an individual level, Morgan retires as England's leading run scorer and most capped player in one day and T20 cricket. I mean, Jim, in terms of England men's white ball captains, he's peerless, isn't he? Well, if you look at the numbers, he's he's way in front of anyone. I mean, you, you go back to the old days of Brealey and Gatting when uh, one day cricket was rarely played. Um, they had pretty good records, but nothing like this. No, no, no. He's miles ahead of everyone in terms of his uh, commitment, his playing record and his leadership. I mean, he won something. He won a trophy for England, a big trophy. And it, it took a long while, longer station for England having com competed from the start when it was the Prudential Cup and made a couple of finals here and there. But, um, no, he's been uh, stunningly successful and uh, he's going to be hard to uh, replace. But uh, it it's a pity he's lost a bit of form because he, he uh, like a lot of fellows who played hockey, I might say, and he was a pretty good hockey player, uh, he turned into a, an outstanding batsman, well, in all forms, but principally in the white ball game and um, he turned things around for England and uh, made the rest of the players realise that they could win a World Cup and uh, that was an astonishing achievement as we heard from, from Jonathan Agnew's commentary in that extraordinary final. So um, as they say, well done him. Uh, it is a record that will live for a long, long time. Well, I can't profess to know him too well, but I do believe that he's a wonderful well, young, may I use the word, young man. Um, so good guys do win. 
I think that's the big story here because he, he, you know, he's led an exemplary life without question. Now, there's, of course, uh, a test match championship now, but wasn't always there. And most cricketers would perhaps, in, during their reign as captain, like to claim that that is their biggest achievement as New Zealand could the first time round. But even though Jim says that we don't know how much one-day cricket is likely to be played now in the face of so much T20 cricket, I still feel that the ICC ODI World Cup is the summit. It's the Everest of achievement these days in terms of popularity. Uh, and, and there's therefore no doubt, as you say, that uh, he is likely to consider that his highest achievement. And of course, it came under very spectacular circumstances. That always helps. I'm sure he'd like to have done much more in red ball cricket. Uh, there's all sorts of T20 success uh, that has come his way. There are personal records, but you know, with records are always going to be broken, so it's not permanent. But he will always be the man who led England to their first ODI World Cup win. That's a very special, well, there's a special ring to that, isn't it? Yeah, indeed. And I've got to know him, you know, over a long period of, of time. And you know, there are certain players that you really miss. You feel they leave such a huge hole in the game because they have been ever present, it feels like. And, and Owen Morgan, I covered him from when he was playing for Ireland, uh, remember. And the 2007 World Cup, he represented the Ireland team. He was part of that famous Irish side that, fam that dumped Pakistan out of the World Cup in 2007 in the Caribbean. And I recall then... In the, in the throes of the, the glows of the after party following that match, sitting poolside back at their hotel after that night. It was St. Patrick's Day as well, so there was a big party going on. Sat there with his dad, and he told me then, with that same sort of steely, determined look in his eye that we've got to know as, as England captain, that he wanted to represent England. And he was not shy or afraid of making that statement in the immediate aftermath of just helping Ireland to you know, their biggest ever win. So he had that ambition and he carried it out. Charu, anyone other than Butler to possibly lead the, the England 50 over side now? Well, considering his spectacular form right now, obviously he's the right choice. But may I quickly ask you at the end of whatever little I have to say now, why not Stokes? Because yes, he's the red ball cricketer, but he's as efficient as devastating a white ball cricketer as well. And if you can load him with test match captaincy, why not uh, ODI a white ball captaincy as well? But yeah, why not Butler? I think he also has a very calm demeanor. To my mind, I mean, just going on positions, of course, this is not really a proven theory, but openers could make very good captains because when they're out to bat, uh, they've got their mind focused on that job. When they're, if they're back in the pavilion, then of course they've got plenty of time to think about what to do with the batting order. In the field, when you don't bowl, you've got plenty of time again to keep a very sharp eye on what's going on. And he has loads of experience. Now, finally on Stumped, at just 15 years of age, Lauren Cheetle was already able to call herself a professional cricketer. At just 17, she was an international fast bowler, making her debut for Australia at the MCG against India. A long and successful career beckoned. She took time off school to play in the T20 World Cup in 2016 and took two for 13 in her first World Cup match against South Africa. But like many sports stars, there have been injuries which set her back. She's currently recovering after a fourth shoulder reconstruction and is hoping to be fit, though, to play for Sydney Sixers in the Big Bash League in just a few months' time. So we thought we'd catch up with Lauren and just see how she is doing. Lauren, welcome to Stump. Tell us where you are at the moment and, and how is the, the injury rehab going? Yeah, hello. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm currently in our new centre at Cricket New South Wales in Sydney. Um, we only opened on Monday, so it's really exciting to talk to you from here. But um, yeah, recovering from a, a fourth Rico and um, seven months in, but looking really, really good and um, hoping it's the last one and I'm ready to go for the start of the season. Yeah, give us a brief sort of history of, of those injuries. I mean, four shoulder reconstructions. I and mean, where, where did they sort of, when and where did they initially start? I suppose that they're old netball injuries of all things. And um, I dislocated them both when I was playing netball when I was younger and then um, got into professional cricket and probably wasn't strong enough at age 15 to um, recover from them properly and um, dove a bit wrong in the field one time and dislocated my left shoulder and, and had a lot of trouble with that. So had that done in 2017 and had it done again in 2018 and then um, had an issue with my right shoulder, had that done 2020, then again last year in 2021. So um, not the best run of um, injury form, but yeah, as I said, hoping it's the last one and, and don't have to deal with them anymore. 
Yeah. How do you feel you have sort of learnt to manage with injuries? Does it get a little easier now because you know the you know the deal and 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 what the rehab from a reconstruction involves and what's the sort of mental approach you take? Yeah, I suppose there's two sides to that. One, um, the really good side is I know what's coming and um, I know the the steps that I need to take to get back onto the field. But um, the other part is like I have to do it again, and and that's really frustrating um, to come to and. I suppose like the good thing, I know what's coming and it's not always easy and it probably isn't always going to go right and um, just try my best to stay positive and thinking of, of little steps and um, how to get back on the field rather than, um, you know, trying to get back straight away, looking at little goals to get there. And um, I've been really lucky to have the support network I have around Cricket New South Wales and the Sydney Sixers. Uh, my family, my friends, my teammates have all been amazing and um, I'm only 23 and um, I feel like I've been through quite a lot and it's made me quite resilient in my sport and um, hopefully it's set me up for, for another good 10 years. 23, yes. It's Jim Maxwell also in Sydney. Nice to talk to you, Lauren, about um, all of this and it looks very positive. Just talk about coming into the game at such a young age, playing for your country. What was that like for you and uh, how did you keep your feet on the ground when it all occurred? It was amazing. Um, but to be honest, I don't really remember it all. Like it was so um, exciting and fun at the time. It was a bit of a whirlwind. I was just living in the moment and didn't really realise how young and important and, and huge it was at the time. Looking back at it now, not being in the international setup and, and missing quite a lot of cricket. Um, I wish I kind of held on to those moments a little bit more. And um, yeah, I was still in school playing for Australia, which is looking back on it really um, something to be really proud of. And um, the setup was completely different to what it is now. And as I said, we're in a, we're in a full-time facility for, for female athletes as well as our male counterparts. And um, I know when I started, we were training two days a week for a couple of hours each night at the SCG. And that was it. And a couple of games on the weekend. And now we have a full 12 game fixture for New South Wales, um, which is huge. And, and yeah, it's just change and growing leaps and bounds. We see our Australian cricketers um, showing the way in world cups and, professionalism and the program and it's just really awesome to be a part of and I'm so lucky that I've seen I've only been a part of cricket for eight or nine years but to see the growth in that time has been huge and it's so exciting to see where the next 10 years are going to go. So you had a different life to your friends at school did you finish school? I did um I did a lot of my exams on the road. I did a few in Sri Lanka and a few in India. Um, I was at the World Cup in India when I was doing my HSC, which um, <laughs> was a bit different to my school, my schoolmates. But um, yeah, my school and my, my teachers were really supportive of my cricket career and um, made a few exemptions for me along the way, which I was really lucky for. And that probably really helped me to finish and graduate school on time with my classmates. So very lucky in that fact. And um, yeah, hugely grateful for the opportunities my school and, and cricket gave me. You haven't played for Australia for three years. Have you? Have you had withdrawal symptoms in that time? <laughs> uh, definitely. Like watching them succeed on the TV has been awesome. Um, I want nothing more than to be back in there. But um, that team is is so good, and it's going to be so hard to crack into. So to see um, the players that have their opportunity and are succeeding is so exciting. And um, as a fan of cricket, I'm absolutely loving where the women are going and and how they're playing the game. So. Um, yeah, I would love to play in there again, but if not, uh, the fan in me is, is loving women and um, the Australian cricket team. Lauren, hi, this is uh, Charu Sharma in New Delhi this time around in India. I understand that you've had more serious health scares in your life other than the shoulder injuries and, and for both you personally, as well as for your loved ones as well. Would you mind telling us a little more about that very unfortunate situation? Yeah, um, last year, it's pretty much a year ago, um, this month I was um, diagnosed with, with skin cancer. I had a melanoma in my shin, um, which for someone at, at 23 is probably a bit unusual. Um, but as you said, like in, in, as well as in my family, both my parents had uh, melanomas and cancer scares as well. So it wasn't something new to me, but um, as, a, as I said, a 23-year-old, it's something I really wasn't expecting. And as again, I was so lucky to get it when I did. Um, I had two operations, one on my shin and one in my groin to get um, the lymph nodes to see if it had spread past my leg. Um, thank goodness it hadn't. I'm very lucky in, in that account. But um, yeah, it's definitely an eye-opening experience for me. And um, it kind of put cricket into perspective for me as well. Um, that I was 
uh, in a pretty tough place from my health point of view and, and it turned cricket into a love again. I, I feel like I may have lost it a little bit through injury and just trying to recover and, and play and um, it was a sport, but it was kind of my life and everything revolved around cricket. But through um, going through that little health scare, it, it became just a sport again and something I love to do. So to come out of it and be healthy and, and happy is, is really good, but it also made me enjoy cricket more. It's extraordinary to, to hear what you've already gone through at just 23. What are you thinking about when you when you look to the future? I know at the moment you, you also do some work for an organisation called What's Ability. Tell us a little bit more about that. What is it exactly? Yeah, so What Ability um, is probably my second love next to cricket. It, um, it's a disability support um, service. And especially what's new, unique about What Ability is they use um, part-time and full-time athletes as their support worker workers to try and you know break down that barrier and stigma around working with um, people with disabilities so um, yeah I'm so excited to be involved in, in one of their support workers and they're going leaps and bounds in where they are in the country we just opened up in Perth we're in we're in Queensland we want to go international and um, just providing support for those that need it and um, again a bit like my, my health scare it's kind of put cricket again into perspective and um, I'm so lucky to be doing what I'm doing um, and I also get to go to work the next day, work with a participant and they know nothing about cricket and they couldn't care less if I've taken five wickets, if I've gone for 50 runs, they do not care. They just want to have a good time and go out for the day. So um, that's probably my favourite part about working with them and um, also just you know, giving joy to those that um, have so many barriers in their life already. Lauren, it's great to hear the smile in your voice and the love of cricket, you know, having been reignited as well. So we wish you all the best with the with the continued rehab, with the shoulder, and really look forward to seeing you back on the park soon. Thanks for being with us on Stumped. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. That is Australian fast bowler Lauren Cheetle. And that is it for us on this week's Stumped programme. So I'll say thank you to Cherry Sharma, Jim Maxwell, and of course to all of you for listening. Make sure you join us again next week. Until then, bye for now. From the BBC World Service, in association with ABC and All India Radio, this is Stumped.